हम लाते हैं टॉप न्यूज आपके फेवरेट टॉक शोज और अनलिमिटेड एंटरटेनमेंट सिर्फ यूट्यूब पर अगर आपने अभी तक हमारा चैनल सब्सक्राइब नहीं किया तो अभी सब्सक्राइब करें और बेल आइकॉन को क्लिक करके हमारी लेटेस्ट वीडियोस के बारे में अपडेट जानें। सब्सक्राइब कीजिए और हम आपको लिए चलेंगे आपकी फेवरेट वीडियो की तरफ असला नाजरीन आज हम एक मुनफरिद प्रोग्राम करने जा रहे हैं कुछ ही देर बाद काबुल से हम ब्राय रास्त जुड़ जाएंगे जहां मेरे कॉलीग समी महादी टोलो टीवी के हेड क्वार्टर से कुछ मेहमानों के साथ हमारा इंतजार कर रहे हैं पाकिस्तान और अफगानिस्तान कई दिहाइयों से दहशत गर्दी के नासूर से लड़ रहे हैं दोनों मुल्क एक दूसरे को मुर्दे इल्जाम ठहराते हैं लेकिन आज हम एक ऐसा शो करने जा रहे हैं जहाँ हम मीडिया इल्जाम तराशी से बाला तर होके एक दूसरे से पूछेंगे कि अफगानिस्तान और पाकिस्तान की रियासत ने दहशत गर्दों से लड़ने के लिए अपनी आवाम को मायूस तो नहीं किया आज दाइश दोनों मुल्कों में सर उठा रही है क्या इसे लड़ने के लिए एक मुश्तका हमत अमली बन सकती है तालिबान दाइश और अलकायदा किसी भी सरहद को नहीं मानते और दोनों मुल्कों की नौजवान नस्ल को तेजी से अपनी सफों में शामिल कर रहे हैं लेकिन अफगानिस्तान और पाकिस्तान दोनों की सुई अपनी अपनी सरहदों पर टिकी हुई है दोनों रियासतें जो हैं उनमें वो काबिलियत या इमेजिनेशन ही नहीं जिसके जरिए इस दुश्मन से वो निपटा निपटे जाने की एक स्ट्रेटजी बना सकते हैं और जो एक हमारा जो दुश्मन है वो बॉर्डर से बारह तर है मगर हमें बॉर्डर्स ने कंटेन किया हुआ है तो आज हम ऐसा नहीं करेंगे हम बॉर्डर से बाला तर हो के बात करेंगे और जल्द ही टोलो न्यूज़ के साथ हम जुड़ जाएंगे पहले मैं आपको बताती चली जाऊं कि इधर पाकिस्तान में हमारे साथ स्टूडेंट ऑडियंस है बहुत शुक्रिया आप सबका आने का और इससे पहले कि मैं अपने गेस्ट का पाकिस्तान में तारुफ कराऊं चलते हैं अफगानिस्तान हाय मुनीजा थैंक यू सो मच एंड अस्सलाम वालेकुम टू आवर व्यूअर्स इन पाकिस्तान एज वेल सो आई एम सामी महदी हियर फ्रॉम टोलो न्यूज इन काबुल एंड माय गेस्ट्स आर हियर मिस शाहरजाद अकबर अ वेल नोन सिविल सोसाइटी एक्टिविस्ट एंड द मेंबर ऑफ अफगानिस्तान Chorda Sat or Afghanistan 1400, and also Mr. Jawed Bloudin, former Deputy Foreign Minister of Afghanistan. Thank you, Sami. Let me introduce my guests here. We have one guest here with us in the studio in Islamabad, uh, Miss Gulmine Bilal Ahmed. She is the director of Individual Land Pakistan, a research-based consultancy and advocacy group with an expertise of working on peace building and counter violent extremism initiatives with youth, women, and children. And in Peshawar, we have somebody who is very well known. to everybody in afghanistan mr rahimullah yusuf zai one of pakistan's most respected voice on militancy in the region he's resident editor in peshawar of pakistan's leading newspaper the news and he also contributes towards the bbc radio he was the first over here to interview the taliban founder mulla mohammad umar and he's twice interviewed usama bin laden so sami uh, allow me to ask your panelists this question because we are talking about militancy in both countries and we have seen how in both countries they have tried to talk to the militants and they have also tried to wage war with the militants recently we saw that you have invited uh, gulbuddin hikmatyar in 2016 in a peace deal my question really is to mr luden mr javed luden by inviting these militants to the negotiating table and giving them a stake within your government and not fighting them has that really affected the war on the battlefield has that really reduced the fighting because from what we have seen the fighting has only increased well thank you very much um i um i i think um first of all uh, we need to understand that militancy um, e- extremism um is um is, is a global challenge it uh, affects the wider region and in particular afghanistan and pakistan are really at the heart of 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 the threat and it has um to address it um uh, we, we have to remain committed to a military um a solution a military approach um as well as a political approach but prim- primarily i believe uh, in one reason that we haven't been successful Uh, across the region to tackle this is because this requires a law enforcement measure this is a um, uh, um and 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 the law enforcement measure would mean that um countries in the region and i uh, particularly afghanistan and pakistan 
but also others in the region should recognize um, this and, and should agree on a definition of what is terrorism, who we can talk to, who we cannot talk to, um, and, then, and then have a combined uh, approach to this. Our approach to, uh, on the Afghan side to uh, speak to some of them and, and uh, integrate them into our system is something that um, I think there is a general consensus, including uh, by Pakistani side. I think the Pakistani side in particular has always emphasized that, um, that, that the military approach uh, should be replaced by a political approach. I think this is a message that's coming uh, loud nowadays from the current Pakistani government. Uh, however, I think um, uh, uh, that's only part of the solution, as I said. Uh, it may have an impact. I think uh, Hekmatyar's um, integration into the political system m may in the long term have uh, a, a positive result and, and, and really uh, People like him in, in his movement are much better on the inside rather than on the outside. So there is absolutely no reason why we should exclude people from a political uh, process. Uh, All right. But I emphasize once again that let's not get uh, delude ourselves. And this message is really, I think, uh, really for the Pakistani audience, uh, that in Pakistan I fail to see a clear consensus and understanding of what constitutes the terrorist threat. Shereza, do you feel the same way? I'm just curious to know whether you would agree Munisa, with Mr. Uh, Mudin. Thank you, Munisa. I agree that what we are currently doing to counter extremism in the region is, uh, um, is insufficient. Um, I also think that because this is a, this is a regional uh, problem, actually a global problem, uh, we need to focus our energy in finding regional solutions. And part of the regional solution is a regional consensus. As Mr. Ludin pointed out, we all need to have a shared understanding of what we consider terrorism, where do we see the problem is, and how we can find solutions collectively as a region. But also taking it a step further beyond governments, I think at the people level also it's important that we do things to counter um, radicalization of our societies and our communities, and there are ways to counter this radicalization through culture, through art, through Mm -hmm. uh, which is a much more long-term and grassroots effort that's also required and needed. When we talk about uh, terrorism and um, what the consensus at least uh, that I feel is that um, uh, when you lose a loved one, when your children die, uh, when, your child, uh, when you're afraid to send your child to a mosque, to a school, uh, to a temple, um, out on the street, uh, then uh, we've got two, um, two ways of thinking about it. One is that we sit and devise a definition of terrorism. The other is to do something about it. Mm. And uh, while I believe that there's a lot of value in looking at this issue from a law enforcement um, uh, angle, um, my fear is that we've only seen it from a law enforcement angle all these Other years. What angle should we be seeing it from? I think uh, one of the guests from Afghanistan said it beautifully, uh, and I would like to second it, right. from a civil society perspective, from, from the perspective of investing more in our people, from addressing uh, uh, the issue, the challenge, as a regional issue, rather than having the President Trump uh, or, or any other European or any other leader to sort of uh, get you and I to the negotiation table. We need to sit down and uh, as, as sons and daughters of the soil, and I emphasize the daughters part, uh, sons and daughters of the soil to sit down because all of us have lost our loved ones. That's true. And but I believe you know, there, that there is a question to be had, and it's a hard question that needs an answer. For example, in Afghanistan, we've said, that you know you have Gulbuddin Hikmatyar there that you're trying to bring into the fold. Now the question I put to you is: We have other banned militant outfits, and the recent by-elections that we have seen in Lahore and Peshawar, both of them have been allowed to contest as independents, and they get more vote than Jamaat e Islami, which is now considered uh, not so extremist. Uh, they are far more extremist. Is this the correct way to go about counter-terrorism? Bring them into the fold allow them to have a space, allow them to have a stake in the elections. 
uh, mainstreaming is one strategy that not just us nowadays we are looking at, but has been in practice historically also and also in contemporary history. Right. Um, while on a personal level, I, I am extremely uncomfortable at mm. the fact that in Pakistan, um, uh, uh, allies uh, or affiliated groups of banned militant organizations have succeeded in in, uh, in in fulfilling the minimum requirements of the Election Commission of Pakistan to register as a as a as a mainstream and political they've got, party. And they've got independence to run. Right. So I, while as a as an individual citizen of this country, I am concerned. You but are concerned. as a okay. as a Democrat who believes in mainstreaming and political expression, I would I would sort of you know well, one say of them that was banned by let the United the Nations. Decide. I'll say two quick things, and, and then we will return to the Pakistani uh, colleagues on this one as well. Um, first of all, uh, the, uh, uh, I, I think there is a difference between Afghan society and Pakistani society in terms of this particular aspect. In Afghanistan, we have to bring in these people because we are at war. These people are attacking us every day, and we have been at war for four, you know, 30 odd years. Um, so for us, it's a bit of um, an, an unavoidable reality, and, 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 and that's part of our stabilization uh, um, effort. Pakistan doesn't have to do this, but they choose to do it. They choose to allow these people to uh, to run free, to organize politics, to um, and and I'm, I'm very uh, afraid for Pakistan. In fact, I think Afghanistan has suffered tremendously, but I think the radicalization that we are seeing not only in the Pashtun areas of Pakistan, but in Punjab, in the heartland of Pakistan, is is immensely um, uh, disturbing, and it should be disturbing for for Pakistanis. So, um, so 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 I think that's why they should have a different approach. I think they should be much, uh, m uh, m much strict on, on what uh, these militants can do politically in the Pakistani society. Otherwise, we will see uh, those elements will get stronger and stronger, and Afghanistan and the rest of the region will suffer. And, 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 and very quickly, in terms of their appeal here and the fact that they haven't won any election in Afghanistan, it was simply, I mean, we, if, if one thing that we have proved in Afghanistan, certainly I will just take the past two years, for example, as an example, when the American troops, 95% of them left this, this country, <coughs> and, and the war was only left to, to the Afghans to fight, the, the Taliban didn't win any victory. In fact, today, the Taliban probably are the weakest in terms of their failure to mobilize any political agenda, a, um, a, a social agenda, a Islamic agenda, All right. um, they're rejected uh, very strongly <coughs> now. By, and the only thing they can do right now is what directly uh, their criminal uh, networks, which is basically drug networks. Um, let, me, let me go and ask a question from Mr. Rahim Law Yusuf Zai. Mr. Yusuf Zai, welcome to the show. Uh, my question is that some um, observers, including Mr. Amir Rana, a very well-known uh, Pakistani author, says that Pakistan is facing with the third generation of militancy, who have turned their uh, guns against the Pakistani state. So we remember those years when uh, Pakistan was just the haven, safe haven for uh, these groups and these groups were not fighting against the uh, Pakistani state. Now they are fighting for a great deal there in Pakistan. How does that change the game, the deal for Pakistani state, Mr. Yusufzai? Sami, before uh, and Yusuf Zaisa, before you answer the question, I'd just like to put on the record that even in Pakistan, whenever there have been elections, the, these extremist militant groups have not got too many votes. The militant group that I was talking about just got 8,000 votes. Uh, so it came number six, number seven on the list. So they have never really captured the imagination of the Pakistani people as far as elections is concerned. Mr. Rahimullah Saab, please go ahead. Yes, I would also like to add uh, to what uh, you know, Munizir said. You know, we have two different uh, kind of uh, Islamic parties or groups. We have the Jamaat Islami and the JUIF of Maulana Fadlur Rahman, two of the biggest Islamic parties. They have taken part in every election. They believe in democracy. They have been in power also. So they are different than the other radical groups, which recently took part in two by-elections in Lahore and Peshawar. But uh, coming uh, to the question asked by Sami Saab, 
you know, uh, yes, I agree that uh, these uh, groups were tolerated in the past. And, you know, they, uh, they were fighting uh, outside Pakistan. Uh, but now uh, these groups, you know, have turned against Pakistan. And that's why we had these big military operations, several, uh, you know, the last one was zarb -e azab in North Waziristan, and then also we had Khaybar 4 in the Tira Valley. So I think that, uh, you know, now these groups actually have splintered. There are factions which are more anti-Pakistan than the others. And they uh, are mostly based, uh, you know, outside Pakistan. They have their, you know, uh, sleeper cells and they have their facilitators, but uh, they're mostly, the leadership is based, uh, you know, mostly in Afghanistan. Mm. So that is, I think, uh, the result, the outcome of Pakistan's policies in the past. And, uh, you know, these policies should change because these groups can then turn against the benefactor you know, who supported them. Mm -hmm. And so the India focus groups, the Pakistan focus groups, they, you know, are now fighting the Pakistani state. But then there are other groups, you know, which are not fighting the Pakistani state. And maybe they are still being tolerated. So we have this, uh, you know, dilemma. Sami, to be fair, change. even Afghanistan has the same dilemma. Now, if you're trying to accommodate some yesteryear warlords, I beg to ask the question and maybe Sherizad can answer that question. <coughs> I'm worried for, for example, Gulbuddin Hikmatyar says he wants a centralized government. He says that he doesn't agree with the present constitution of Afghanistan. So if they don't agree, will you come round to their demands? And if they do have a stake in the process and they bring in the yesteryear's warlords, you're letting Afghanistan slip again into civil war. And then we are back to, uh, you know, uh, point zero. So what are we really looking at? Is there any opportunity? Is there any advantage of speaking to these yesteryear's warlords? Shouldn't they be part of the past now? There have been many changes to our politics and policy, but the one thing that we have consistently, the Afghan government and the Afghan people have consistently uh, been open to is a process of um, a political process, uh, a dialogue, conversation, bringing people to the fold, opening the political space, this has constantly be our, been our approach. And in the past few years, it, we had the same approach to Pakistan as well. We are interested in building a, a, a regional consensus. We are interested in building political consensus within Afghanistan. We don't see a, an advantage in war. It's taking lives away. It's destroying um, our development agenda. We want to move ahead. And we have consistently, Afghan people and Afghan government have been consistent about this messaging. Mm. The problem is, is Pakistan is players in the region, are they able to reimagine their relationship with Afghanistan? Because I think reimagining that relationship with Afghanistan as an equal state, as a country whose peace and prosperity will bring peace and prosperity to the region can have a huge impact on the war that's going on in Afghanistan. I think this is where we are not convinced that there, there is a consensus, there's a shared understanding. When it comes to the Afghan side, there are many, many voices for peace, many, many voices for political process and, 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 and moving beyond this current conflict. So I wanted to say that Mr. Gurubidi Nekmatyar and not, not just his, uh, his Islami, but many other political groups want some changes in uh, the constitution, our current constitution. But the current constitution has shown us the ways for, the peaceful ways for changing it. Mm. So Mr. Gulbuddin Hikmatyar and others have agreed to, if they want to change the constitution, they should go through the process. Uh, now we would like to hear from uh, the, uh, the response to uh, what uh, Shahrzad was yes. saying. Yeah, I will, it's not a direct response, but what I'm trying to s sort of uh, highlight are three points. Mm. Uh, we, have, we have a shared history, we have shared uh, magnitude of challenges. There was a time, and Rahimullah Sahab would remember that, there was a time when we also were compelled internally within our country to talk to groups who were openly, publicly declaring that they do not subscribe to the constitution of the, of, of the country. But we saw that because of 
a number of, you can call it whatever, but because we, we were compelled to negotiate with them, to talk to them, and uh, at a personal level, I might, I might even say uh, to sort of uh, let them browbeat us. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But uh, that is where the shared lesson is. And I think that is why it is important that without external actors at the table, you and I, Pakistanis and Afghans, need to sit at the same table, have the same meal that we enjoy, and, and talk about our shared challenges. Mm -hmm. um, uh, regarding uh, uh, the concern for Pakistan, uh, I think the concern is is a is is a, is a well considered one. Uh, we, as a I, as a member of the civil society, am also concerned for the country. Concerned uh, for the fact that um, uh, there was a time in in our country where we would see uh, absolutely no institutional response. Uh, to the growing physical space uh, that banned militant organizations and their mainstreamed allied groups um, would have. For example, um, uh, I, I think I think examples are are fresh and there are many. Okay. Um, but uh, at least now we see that at least for some groups uh, we see shrinking physical space, shrinking social media space. So there's been space. a change. There has been a change. All right. Now you and I can both wish, and we can both sit and say that there should be an, uh, there should be uh, an equal playing field for all kinds of groups. But that is part of the struggle. But instead of looking in the past, instead of the rear view driving, we need to sit together and see how can we get youth to connect. How can okay, we get we'll the come media to that. To That's a very important topic. But before we get into that, this is a question both to Rahimullah Saab and to Nurun Saab uh, in Kabul and Peshawar. There is a perception and a very, uh, let's say, uh, you know, a pessimistic perception that <coughs> there is a war economy in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And if war ends, then nobody stands to benefit, not the Taliban who are gaining from the opium trade, not the Afghan government. And this is what uh, hardline critics say, that uh, they are dependent on foreign aid. And, and uh, even Pakistan, there is, a, there is a question about Pakistan. Will Pakistan be able to give up its strategic depth vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban in Afghanistan? So is that a fact and is that a real problem? Rahimullah Saab, first you, and then we can cross over to Kabul. You know, this has been discussed, you know, that there's a war economy, it's business, and many people are profiting, and they will not like to have a peace process. You know, we have heard this, we have seen this. You know, there are warlords even now operating in Afghanistan, and some of these warlords, you know, have been criticized in the Afghan media that they are a threat to the Afghan government, they are a threat to the civilians as well. So that is true. We also raised, you know, militias uh, earlier when the Pakistani military and police was operating against the militants, and these militias, in some cases, like in Moment Agency became uh, a state uh, into a state. They became very powerful. They were defying the law. So, you know, uh, again, we are hearing that in Afghanistan, you know, maybe more militias would be raised hmm. to fight the Taliban or to defend their villages. So I think this policy of, you know, uh, of arming civilians and making them fight against the enemy that policy has its disadvantages and its risk. Uh, but I think that, you know, uh, uh, as Munizia said, that has Pakistan given up its past policies? So that, uh, you know, we have to look into that because there is, I think, a realization that uh, there can be no strategic depth in Afghanistan unless Afghan government and Afghan people become friends of Pakistan. And also right. that, uh, you know, this policy is not going to work. So I think this policy, I believe, has been given up. There's no such policy right, that's right now that we want the strategic depth. Uh, Javed Luden, do you really believe that? Because also we have seen that our chief of army staff, General Kamar ba Javed Bajwa, went to Afghanistan, to Kabul. He met with your president, Ashraf Ghani. And that was looked at very favorably. And there was some kind of hope that things would change. Do you feel that things would change? And even on your side, there is a concern that poppy growing is helping the Taliban. So why would a Taliban commander give up poppy growing where he's earning millions of rupees and want peace? Similarly, what about the foreign aid that comes to your government? Would they be able to survive without that? 
Well, the question of war economy is the right one, and, 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 and I think it was very good that you raised it, because that's one of the, uh, one of the biggest factors that's driving war, not only in this region, but globally. Mm. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the current militancy uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and they are, by the way, they are connected very deeply because it would be a mistake to just make these distinctions between this party and these. Because one of the, the tactical things that these elements do is to spread themselves to, uh, to proliferate uh, with different names. And some of them talk, some of them uh, um, fight. Um, but I think uh, a mistake that we as, as, as the two countries here can make is to then generalize our response and say, we either just have to speak to these people, we can't fight them, or there is um, no law enforcement uh, response, there is only uh, um, political response. Right. But going back to your war economy question, uh, it's not only drug economy that's running this, there is a, there's, there's a, a international arms trade that's, fine, that, that's involved, there's a human trafficking uh, mafia that's involved. There's obviously a very complex web. Right. But does th is that the reason for us to then say, okay, well, we can't help it? Right. But I would say, I would argue, and I will end here, is that if today Pakistan really wholeheartedly the Pakistani military establishment, and I'm not talking about the civilian alone, but the, the establishment that's controlling the policy on these things, on foreign policy and on security, if they really get a, a change of heart and cooperate honestly with Afghanistan, with the kind of uh, a global um, preparedness that we are seeing now uh, against the threat of extremism, I think we can succeed. We can overcome the drug trade as well. It will be much more difficult uh, than many other aspects, uh, but, but we can do it. But the main reason we are failing and we have failed in the last 16 years is because Pakistani military establishment has been the weakest link because they have never cooperated honestly and, okay. uh, and effectively. There was a time when the Taliban was uh, known as a Pakistani franchise in Afghanistan. But now we see some other countries, some other states have uh, stepped in. Uh, f for example, we hear from Russia that they have got some contacts with, 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 uh, or cooperations with the Taliban, uh, intelligence co cooperation with the Taliban. We heard uh, some kind of similar things from uh, the Iranian uh, uh, government that they have got some contacts with the Taliban. We, have it we from know Saudi that Arabia. about the Afghan Taliban. What about the Pakistani Taliban? Rahimullah Saab, you know the question that, has, that was also asked is, is the Pakistan army the weakest link? I would like him to answer that question also and if the Pakistan army is the weakest link then you know you're already giving examples of Saudi, Iran and Russia already meddling in Afghanistan. So really is Pakistan army the weakest link Mr. Rahimullah Yusufzai? You know, um, maybe let me just uh, say one sentence before I come to your questions. You know, uh, you have to be a Pakistani to think about the Indian threat. You know, you, I understand <laughs> as an Afghan, you know, you have the right to have relations with any country, but you know, India, Pakistan, they have gone to war four times. And Pakistan faces a real threat from India. So, you know, I think Pakistani sensitivities about India should be taken into account, you know. That is my reply. But the other question is that, you know, there is a sense of relief, I believe, in the Pakistani establishment. It is not only Pakistan now, which is blamed for having contacts or supporting the Afghan Taliban, but also Russia and Iran and maybe even China and other countries. So there, you know, I think why these countries are contacting the Taliban, why hmm. they want to support the Taliban or give them weapons, maybe it is because they have a common enemy. In the case of Iran, the common enemy is the US. In the case of Russia, the common enemy is uh, ISIS, Daesh. That could be the reason because China also has very old contacts with Taliban. And who is the common and, you know, they, enemy in the case of Pakistan? Who is the, the common, case Mr. Of Pakistan, Zay, who is the common enemy yes, in the case of Pakistan? You know, you could say it's India, you know, because they think Pakistani establishment believes that India, you know, has gained ground in Afghanistan and that could be used against Pakistan. So, you know, there are all these issues.
we you we can sit here and sort of talk about uh, about about the perception on the Afghan side of Pakistan not being serious about about peace, and and we can sit and talk about uh, the perception that uh, that that our challenges and problems in Balochistan are sort of Afghan and Indian led, but that is a conversation that has. A beginning, but has no end, and it has no result. Mm. Um, I think we need to move beyond that conversation. Uh, we also we are looking at this entire thing uh, from a security paradigm, and I believe this has been our mistake for about three decades now. You talk about war economy, let us also talk about a peace economy. Uh, there is uh, uh, there is absolute dividends in peace, and we need to highlight this. And I'm also a little concerned that as as a, on the on the Pakistani uh, side, we believe that there has been progress uh, on uh, on on institutionalized response. In, in fighting radical mi uh, uh, mindsets and militant organizations, the perceptions can be different, but the reality is what we experience every day. All right. Their reality is different, but I think we need to sort of, it's, instead of assuming each other's realities, we need to sit and sort of share what the what the path ahead can be. Somebody else who has a question for uh, uh, people in Afghanistan? Uh, for yes, I Afghanistan? actually do have a question. Don't you think that fencing the border, which we have seen now, is uh, becoming an issue for the Afghan side, that they don't want it to happen? But if you look at the statistic, it's going to stop the drug problem, the trafficking problem. Let's, let's take the question, why would not uh, Afghanistan fence its border? And I'll add to that, there is not a single soldier there on the Afghan side. We have seen no drone attacks in, in some of the provinces that are close to us on the border. Why is that? I mean, if, if you're concerned about militants going from this side to that side, why not uh, attack them right there when they cross? I think it's a misleading question to focus on the border because I don't <laughs> think that's where the problem is. The problem, um, you cannot, I mean, I know Mr. Trump has now decided to uh, fence its border with Mexico and, and you know where that is ending. It's becoming a laughing stock in the world. The Pakistani uh, government has done this for a very long time to try to focus the international community's attention on the border issue. Whereas the main problem is in Quetta, the fact that the Taliban establishment has for decades um, um, been, been, been set there and that's where the, 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 their leadership is and their leadership council is. There is a, shura, there is a Peshawar uh, Shura of the Taliban and that's where the eastern side uh, front is controlled from. Um, it's actually very good to see that uh, you have guests from the universities. I think part of the solution to our problems lies with our generation and it's twofold. On the one fold, I think it's time for all of us to really look closely at radicalization that's happening in our communities, in our society and be activists, voices, uh, change makers that challenge that radical attitude that's really limiting, shrinking the space for all of us, for everyone, for minorities, for women, for media, for freedom of expression. The other part of it is the political and the interaction between the two countries. I think we really need to talk, start talking to each other and, and listening from each other without involving many other actors. So my, my question is, Mr. Yusufzai, um, that um, why people sitting in Karachi, in uh, uh, Peshawar and Kuwaita, who are called uh, Kuwaita Shura, Peshawar Shura, are not being handed over to Afghan uh, authorities by the Pakistani government. What is preventing them from that? And to you add know, to that, Sami, just your suggestion have, of how to uh, get rid Sami, of all these problems. Sami, yeah. Sami, we need to have uh, a treaty. We should be having a treaty to extradite people who are wanted. You know, the Afghan government has given a list of 86 people, I believe, and Pakistan has given a list of 75 people who are in Afghanistan. So this, you know, this should be, you know, a mutual thing. You know, you cannot uh, have a one-sided thing. So, you know, this should be discussed. And if possible, there should be an exchange of, uh, you know, prisoners, also exchange of wanted people. This, you know, this cannot, uh, you know, uh, you cannot uh, do this thing, uh, you know, on one side. All so right. I think also, also they should, you know, inspect, jointly inspect the so-called safe heavens on both sides. So, you know, Senator John McCain came here and there was a, an informal agreement that we can jointly inspect all the safe heavens on both sides 
and we can take action against that. That's Spanish a very good suggestion. Just last one line, please. Instead of closing. a security perspective, let's yeah. start thinking uh, of, of, a, of a people's perspective. Hmm. Um, and let's start the conversation. All right, so let's begin the conversation. Thank you so much, Sami, for joining us from Kabul, both your guests. We should basically talk to each other rather than indulge in a blame game. That's certainly the consensus here in Pakistan. And the way forward is to have joint exercises, jo joint counterterrorism efforts, and jointly point out the safe havens that exist in both countries. I hope we can work together rather than against each other. Thank you so much for joining us from Kabul, from Islamabad, and from Peshawar. Good night. Thank you.